World War II was over, and Gary, Indiana was a prosperous place to be. Gary, Indiana, Gary, Indiana, Gary, Indiana, let me say it once again. In 1957, Gary, The Music Man was the most popular show on New York's Broadway, and the song Gary, Indiana was a national hit. There was plenty to bring a smile to the face of the people of Gary in those years. World War II created a lot of business for the steel industry, and peacetime was just as good. Almost everyone was sure that Gary would be the center of industry in the United States for years to come. And why shouldn't they feel that way? Just 50 years earlier, in 1906, there was no Gary. It was built on the sand dunes and wetlands by U.S. Steel, America's greatest industrial enterprise. It was a modern city. People called it the Magic City of Steel. By the 1950s, Gary was Indiana's second largest city and still moving up. On the surface, it looked like Gary would be the Magic City of Steel for generations to come. Gary, Indiana! boxing ring, Gary was in the national spotlight in the years after the war. The city had reason to be proud. One reason was Tony Zale. Just before the war, this native of Gary's Central District won boxing's middleweight crown. The war put an end to the title fights, but in 1946, Zale defended his title against Rocky Graziano. It was a fight that some rank as one of the best of all time. I knocked him down the first round, he knocked him down the second round. Third or fourth, fifth rounds, why he poured on me hot and heavy. I hit him with a right, left, right, left, right, you know, and I kept coming on after him. Fifth round, he kind of stopped as though the one that was holding the guy up, I can't knock him down anymore. Well, I knocked him on the sixth round that night. Zale won and came back to Gary a hero. His nickname was the Man of Steel. Zale later lost his title as middleweight champ, won it back, and retired after losing it again in 1949. Gary had another hero in the years after the war. A young actor named Carl Malden was winning rave reviews. In 1951, he won an Academy Award as Best Supporting Actor in the film version of A Streetcar Named Desire. Malden grew up in Gary. His real name was Mladen Sekulovic. And about 25 years before he won his Academy Award, he was performing as a part of a Serbian singing group in Gary. He had a long and successful career in film and on TV. But while the daily newspaper delivery brought a lot of good news to the doors of Gary residents, the city's image took a major blow in the months following the end of World War II. As the school year began in September of 1945, hundreds of white students at Frable didn't show up for school. They were protesting the growing number of blacks in their school. They wanted Frable to be all white. Longtime principal Charles Coons retired in 1942. The new principal was Richard Nuzum, and he made some more changes. Among other things, Nuzum allowed blacks to use the boys' swimming pool for the first time and to join the orchestra. Strike leader Leonard Lavenda said the white students didn't want to share the same band instruments and the swimming pool with black students. One of the demands made by the strikers was for Nuzum to be fired. A group called the Anselm Forum was active in Gary at the time. It was established to promote good relations among the various races, religions, and cultures in Gary. To try to put an end to the strike, they contacted a man idolized by teenagers of the time and asked him to come to Gary. In 1945, Frank Sinatra was the idol of many American teens. At the time, he was also interested in using his popularity to deliver a message to his young fans. So, Sinatra accepted the invitation to come to Gary. He canceled a $10,000 engagement and came for free. Schools were shut down the day Sinatra arrived, so students could attend the show at Memorial Auditorium. Nearly 6,000 showed up. The Gary Post Tribune said many of them were young women who screamed at the sight of the star. One high school girl is watching Frankie through a pair of binoculars. As he passes her by, he smiles. 
Now she starts to swoon, but the crowd's so dense, there's no room for her to hit the floor. I, live in. I, sh I shall never forget the song that he sang. The house I live in was um, the refrain and the common denominator that 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 he used. That was very bold, very very bold uh, act or position to take in 1945. Sinatra sang and delivered a sermon. The eyes of the nation are watching Gary, Sinatra told the crowd. You have got to go back to school if you don't want to be ashamed of yourselves as a student body. I'm sure you don't want to be ashamed of being an American. Let's do things the American way. The reviews were mixed. The students liked his singing. Many didn't care for his preaching. It was nice, but I don't think it accomplished anything. He said too much about Americanism and not enough about the racial problem in Gary. His singing sent me, but the rest of the program was dull. Sinatra's appearance did not end the strike, but it did draw national attention to Gary. Just two years earlier, Gary received positive national publicity when Life magazine ran a cover story on women working in the mills during the war. Now the nation's leading magazine was back. Gary was pictured as a racially divided city. The National Urban League, an organization promoting equality for blacks, came into the picture at this time. They sent a man from St. Louis to start a chapter in Gary. His name was Joseph Chapman. Chapman's first goal was to get the white students and black students together and to talk over their differences. When they emerged from the meeting, they had a solution. And their feeling was this, that we should not be the only school, Freedom, that has black and white students. Black and white students ought to be found in all the high schools in the areas where blacks and whites might happen to live together. The students said they would not strike again and urged the school board to issue a policy of citywide school integration. The strike forced the school board to act. By the start of the 1947 school year, the 41-year policy of segregation was over in the Gary schools. A group of young men from the city's immigrant community was working its way into a position of leadership in the years after the war. The group was headed by George Chicharis, who came to Gary from his native Greece as a 10-year-old. The young Chicharis loved sports and loved people. At the age of 24, he organized a social and athletic club in Gary Central District. It was called Club SAR, using the first letters from the words social, athletic, and recreational. Drawing from all ethnic groups in the Central District, Club SAR put together a basketball team that was nationally competitive. One of the stars was an athletic young man named Peter Mandich. But these were the Depression years, and Club SAR also became active by delivering food to the needy ethnic families of the Central District. From these roots in the immigrant community, Club SAR became politically active just before and during the war. But it was after the war that its political power blossomed. In the years after the war, gambling and prostitution were also blossoming in Gary. The city was developing a reputation as a place where bookies, car dealers, policy operators, and prostitutes did a great business. There were letters in the paper about these women whose husbands worked in the mill, and um, they never got home with a paycheck because uh, these places were available to them on their way home, and they cashed the paycheck right there and lost it with the gambling and everything else. Gary's political leaders were accused of looking the other way. Some said the politicians were bought off by the syndicate. A St. Louis newspaper wondered how Mayor Joseph Finnerty could retire in such luxury. He left his $8,000 a year job as mayor at the start of 1948. According to the paper, when he retired, he owned property in Florida. Two mansions, two yachts, an airplane, and a bank account of $3 million. For Gary's African Americans, the late 40s were a time of struggle for employment rights. From the beginning, Gary's two major hospitals were closed to African American physicians. By the late 1940s, black patients were allowed, but the medical staff was entirely white. After the war, Urban League director Joseph Chapman worked with local black physicians to get that changed. The hospitals were reluctant. The black doctors and the Urban League put a large ad in the Gary Post Tribune just before Easter pointing out that the policies of the two Christian hospitals were contrary to the teachings of Christ. With help from an Urban League board that included Gary Post Tribune owner H.B. Snyder 
and U.S. Steel Superintendent S.M. Jenks, the ban was soon lifted, but only after years of work. The town didn't fall apart. The hospital didn't fall apart. One or two of the early black physicians there did experience some, uh, say, displeasure from some of the physicians. But for the most part, they took it in stride, and it was what should have happened. In the years following the war, it was also a struggle for Gary's African Americans to find mid-level jobs, jobs that were traditionally reserved for whites. Uh, it was uh, a time when uh, getting a job for an African American living in the city uh, to drive a bus, that was a major accomplishment. Uh, getting an African American to be a route salesman uh, for uh, a local dairy company. That was a tremendous accomplishment uh, uh, in, 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 in those years. Blacks were limited in employment opportunities. For instance, the Gary Railways, which was in existence then, and operated streetcars and buses up and down the streets of Gary, did not hire blacks as drivers or chauffeurs. The story was the same in many of the downtown retail stores where white merchants feared a loss of white customers if there were black clerks. Although efforts to change that were underway in the 40s, it wasn't until the 50s and 60s that real progress began to be made. If Gary's African Americans were being denied opportunities in their hometown, some were finding ways to let their talents show in other parts of the country. From 1936 to 1958, the Steel City Chicks were one of the best women's softball teams in the Midwest, if not in the country. They were so good that on weekends they would draw crowds of up to 20,000 for their games in Gary. They were so good that teams all across Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Ohio, and Kentucky wanted to play them. Even all white teams wanted to play the Steel City Chicks at a time when blacks and whites generally didn't participate in sports against each other. The Chicks were almost unbeatable, winning numerous tournaments during their 22-year history. On the night of March 3, 1949, a Gary school teacher was murdered. The victim was Mary Cheever. Around 11 o'clock, she was coming home to her West 8th Avenue apartment. Just after putting her car in the garage, she was attacked by a man who wanted her purse. Mary Cheever was well-known and well-liked. Her murder shocked the students and the teachers who knew her best. It also angered some women in Gary who felt the streets were no longer a safe place to be at night. And uh, Berlin Brownell, who worked for the Post Tribune, called all the different women's groups and said, we're going to meet tonight in Seaman Hall. That was in the um, Methodist Church on 6th and Broadway. And we're going to rise up and see what can be done about this. 2,000 people gathered at Seaman Hall that night, mostly women. The meeting was brief. The group left Seaman Hall and headed to City Hall. The city council was meeting that night. And we marched from 6th and Washington down Broadway, hundreds of us. It was, it was a sight. It was in all the Chicago papers, even in the New York papers. And we got there. And of course, only a small percentage could get inside the meeting because there was no room in the, in the chambers. The council heard the angry complaints. Mary Cheever was the eighth person murdered in Gary in a year that was just over two months old. The group demanded the city do something about it. That night, the Women's Citizens Committee was formed. It was the women of Gary who came together and formed the Women's Citizen Committee uh, they really did storm the city hall <laughs> and uh, were uh, very, uh, very interested in making it safe for people to be on the streets at night. The women felt the murder rate was linked to widespread gambling, prostitution, and vice in the city of Gary. They believe Gary's political leaders looked the other way and allowed the vice rackets to flourish in the city. They didn't close it. They didn't frown on it. They, they let them stay open for a price. Gary was seen in the national media as a town whose politicians allowed vice and gambling to flourish. Meanwhile, the killer of Mary Cheever was never found. Mayor Schwartz said he'd clean up the city, but when the Women's Citizens Committee looked around, they saw the gambling places still open for business. So the women went back into action, 
they instituted Operation Shoe Leather. Wearing their Women's Citizens Committee armbands, volunteers protested outside some of the brothels, saloons, and gambling houses. It did hurt business. These businessmen would drive up with their big cars, and they'd start to get out, and then they'd see these women, and some of them, they knew who they were. And boy, they were in the cars and gone before you knew it. The women's group also won the support of many men. They formed a new group called the Gary Crime Commission. We did some interesting things. There was a prosecutor that they knew was on the take and letting people go if they just pay him. And so um, some of these men, uh, at the risk of life and limb, I guess, they got a, across the, the roofs of the buildings there on Broadway between 5th and 6th, and they, they put a, a microphone or whatever you call it a, 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 in, in the that office of that man. And we have today the, the booklet that we wrote from it, and it was all taken from these things where he was making deals with everyone. It's called the microphone speaks is what we called it. And it exposed what all of these politicians were doing, working hands in glove with these other people, too. I might be able to make a deal with the state excise police captain for you. Tell him to lay off you. That's going to take some dough. $500 to me. I'll talk to him. Say, have you got any liquor out there? Yeah, why? We want some for a party we're giving tomorrow night. Well, you tell me what you want, and I'll get some tomorrow. The prosecutor's office was a main target of the Women's Committee in the 1950 election. In the primary, challenger Mitro Halavachka almost beat prosecutor Benjamin Schwartz. And in the fall, Schwartz did lose to David Stanton. Stanton hired Halavachka as his deputy, and they quickly went to work trying to close down the syndicate operations. Their success was limited. The Women's Citizens Committee also tried to influence the mayor's race in 1951. Hilda Burton, one of its members, ran for the mayor's office. Using hundreds of volunteers, she was considered one of the four top contenders for the Democratic nomination. City controller Byrne Baldrich had the support of Mayor Eugene Swartz. Another candidate was former city clerk Anthony Dobis, and also running was township trustee Peter Mandich, the candidate of the club czar organization of the city's ethnic community. Mandich beat out Dobis, with Burton finishing third. From its founding, Gary was always a city with a strong ethnic population, but it had always been ruled by non-ethnic whites. With the election of Mandich, for the first time, the mayor's office was won by someone of Gary's ethnic community. It was an historic shift of power in the city. Gary's new mayor had been a college football star at Tulane University, but he was by no means the only star athlete the city produced in the post-war years. Gary's Chuck Atkins was a collegiate champion boxer at San Jose State and in 1952 became the first American to win a gold medal in boxing's light welterweight division. Lee Calhoun, a track star at Gary Roosevelt, came home a hero after he won Olympic gold. He did it twice. Calhoun won the 110-meter hurdles in 1956, and in 1960, he won a second gold medal at the Olympics in Rome. Gary's Alex Karras had a football career at Iowa that led to a place in the College Football Hall of Fame a successful pro career with the Detroit Lions, and an acting career after that. The Women's Citizens Committee kept up the pressure. They were pleased when local syndicate boss Jack Doyle got sent to prison on federal tax charges. They were pleased when Mayor Mandich hired Deputy Prosecutor Mitro Halavachka as city controller and James Traeger as police chief. Both were considered enemies of the syndicate. But six months later, the Women's Citizens Committee was back at City Hall and angry. Halavachka took over as acting mayor when Mandich went on a trip to Florida, and he fired Traeger. Halavachka said Traeger's police department was harassing immigrants by breaking up nickel and dime card games. The women's group called Halavachka a traitor to good government. But by the end of the year, Halavachka had moved up to a new job. He ran for prosecutor and beat out former boss Republican David Stanton. Mandich had to appoint a new city controller. He chose George DeCheris, the founder of Club Czar. This is the year of 1956, a year of jubilee throughout the Calumet area, for this is the golden anniversary of the founding of the magic city of steel, Gary, Indiana. Music 
1956 was a year to celebrate in Gary. The city was 50 years old. Many of the men in the city, including members of the city council, wore mustaches that year. It was one way to honor the old pioneers who settled the town. They also had a parade that summer. Hometown hero Tom Harmon was the Grand Marshal, and he had the honor of crowning the Golden Jubilee Queen. It was also a time to celebrate because the future looked bright for Gary. But the story of Gary is still unfinished. The 50 years which have gone by may form only the preface to the story which will unfold itself in the next 50 years. Gary's epic rise from the obscurity of nothingness to the estate of Indiana's second largest city has captured the world's imagination. Citizens were proud of Gary's growth from zero to 160,000 people in just 50 years. As one Chamber of Commerce official said, many expected an even larger city in the years ahead. We barely edge past Fort Wayne to become the number two city in the state, but in the next census we'll leave Fort Wayne far behind in the standings. There was reason to celebrate in 1956. Downtown was bustling. Just the year before, a new concept in shopping came to town. It was called the Shopping Center. And even though the Village Shopping Center opened to enthusiastic crowds, downtown was still the center of activity. But for those paying close attention, there were plenty of problems facing Gary not far beneath the surface. The problems included pollution, race, political corruption, and labor problems, not to mention a rapidly changing world. For years, the beach at Marquette Park was for whites only. There was no law keeping blacks out, but it was clear they weren't welcome. An attempt was made to integrate in 1949. The Reverend L. K. Jackson was one of the leaders. Less than 100 people marched to the beach. The newspaper labeled them as communists and outside agitators. Another attempt was made in 1953, and there was trouble. Trouble at Marquette Beach started when six Negro women, in an effort to escape the intense heat of the city, journeyed to the beach. They were attacked by a mob of white teenagers in the presence of three police officers who refused to make any arrest. One woman was slapped, five others were cursed and insulted. The latest incident was last Sunday when three persons were struck with a bottle. The police chief, John Foley, again blamed the unrest on professional left-wingers, but the local Urban League chapter, led by Clifford Minton, continued to push for integration of Marquette Park. In 1954, the city council publicly gave its support to integration, but there were still racial incidents at the beach into the 1960s. There were also charges of political corruption throughout the 1950s. Mitro Halavacchia was in the center of the controversy. A U.S. Senate Rackets Committee was investigating charges that the Lake County prosecutor was allowing a multi-million dollar slot machine operation to thrive in northwest Indiana. The accusations against Halavacchia were aggressively pursued by a young attorney named Robert Kennedy, brother to Massachusetts Senator John Kennedy. Gary was also developing a bad reputation for pollution problems by the late 1950s. Before the steel mill came, the Sabinski family lived on Miller Beach. They were fishermen. As the area grew, tree stops, debris, and other waste began clogging their fishing nets. August Sabinski lived along the lakefront until his death in the early 60s. Before he died, he said fishermen like him were relics of the past. He said the lake has swallowed too much pollution and grime from the local factories. The fish were here in abundance, but they have left Lake Michigan for cleaner waters. Fish are gone, the gulls are gone, everything's gone. The nuts have ruined everything. The labor unions were also calling the steel industry names in the 1950s. They went on strike in 1952. That strike lasted 55 days. It might have lasted longer, but President Truman stepped in and forced a settlement. Workers received a pay hike, and the steel industry was permitted to raise prices. Another strike in 1956 led to long lines as workers applied for public assistance. Once the strike ended, wages went up another 45 cents an hour. But the longest strike took place when that contract expired. In 1959, workers voted to strike. They were off the job for 116 days. For some, it was rough. For many merchants in Gary, it was also very rough. It was another reminder that Gary was basically a one-industry town. I uh, never lost a, uh, my payments on my house, and uh, I borrowed money from the credit union to get through the strike, and my family was well-fed and had no problems. And even after I went back, I still owed no bills like a lot of people had to. 
President Eisenhower, who campaigned in Gary in 1952, called the strike to an end. He ordered the workers back on the job without a contract. Workers lined up at the pay window, happy to be finally getting a paycheck. Over the years, the frequent battles between labor and management helped to change the nature of the steel workers' job. With better wages, vacation, health and retirement benefits, as well as better hours and working conditions, the steel worker of the second half of the 20th century enjoyed a much higher standard of living than those who came before. In 1957, the Catholic Church created a diocese of Gary and named the bishop to serve as the leader of the area's 40,000 Catholic families. His name was Andrew Grutka, the son of Slovak immigrants. At 48, he was the youngest bishop in the United States. A two-hour and 45-minute ceremony was held to consecrate him as the new bishop. Archbishop Paul Schulte of Indianapolis gave the sermon and he predicted that the southern end of Lake Michigan, from Chicago to Michigan City, would one day be home to over two million people. In 1958, the city honored Albert H. Gary with a statue on the front lawn of City Hall. Inside City Hall, there was also a change. Just three years earlier, in 1955, Peter Mandich became the first Gary mayor to win two terms back to back. But in 1958, he resigned as mayor in order to run for the office of Lake County Sheriff. Taking his place in the mayor's office was city controller George Tucheris. Tucheris was always visible as part of the Mandich administration. He was a very active city controller. As mayor, he was even busier. During his years in office, George Tucheris seemed to be everywhere. He attended countless weddings, swept city streets, attended sporting events, met with visiting celebrities like the star of the TV show The Cisco Kid, the cast from the musical The Music Man, or the Harlem Globetrotters. He milked a cow at the Lake County Fair and raced in the soapbox derby. The mayor was actively involved in every detail of life in the city. He also worked closely with Illinois Senator Paul Douglas to save the Indiana Dunes and establish a national lakeshore. In 1959, Chicharis ran for a full four-year term as mayor. He won by a huge majority, the largest victory in Gary's history. Up to that time, Chicharis was indeed popular. In the opinion of some, Gary never worked better than it did when Chicharis was mayor. Improvements were made in police and fire protection, as well as in garbage pickup and snow removal. New street lights and traffic lights were installed. And if anyone had a problem, they could call the mayor at home to ask for his help. He was always available. G. Gordon Liddy became famous in the 1970s for his role in the Watergate break-in that led to the resignation of President Nixon. But from 1958 to 1960, he was an FBI agent stationed in Gary. In his autobiography, he said he was impressed by the way things worked in the Steel City. Gary resembled Mayor Daly's Chicago. It was a city that worked. Every ethnic group had a piece of the action, public officials made a fortune from graft, and organized crime flourished on prostitution and gambling. In 1960, John Kennedy ran for president. He and his wife, Jacqueline, visited Gary early in the campaign. Kennedy toured the steel mills and was wined and dined by local Democrats. But after the election, some of those same local Democrats were being investigated by the Kennedy administration. The president's brother was appointed attorney general. Bobby Kennedy had investigated Mitro Halavachka when he was a Senate committee attorney in the 50s. Now, as attorney general, the investigation intensified. In 1961, the former Lake County prosecutor was indicted on tax evasion charges. The government claimed Halavachka accepted graft payments. He was found guilty and sentenced to prison. Halavachka never admitted to any wrongdoing, claiming he was victimized by Bobby Kennedy. Halavachka said Kennedy vowed to get even with him when Halavachka refused to support John Kennedy for vice president in 1956. Halavachka served over two years in prison. While checking into Halavachka's records, federal investigators also noticed suspicious transactions during the Mandich and Chicharis administrations. In 1962, Mandich, Chicharis, and five others were indicted on charges that they accepted kickbacks money which contractors had to pay for doing business in Gary. After the trial began, Chicharis pled guilty and resigned as mayor. Charges were dropped against Mandich. The judge in the case said there was no evidence that Chicharis was trying to get rich from the kickbacks, 
but that he was using the money to secure the political operation he had built. Chicharis spent nearly two years in prison. Just days before Chicharis was charged, a birthday party was held in his honor. The 54-year-old mayor accepted a portrait of himself as a gift, as well as a check for $75,000. In a speech to the crowd of friends, he attacked his critics, particularly the press, saying they are a part of Gary's old ruling class. He also made a prediction. We came from the people of Gary, and we are now in the ruling positions of our community. And these same people who used to rule Gary now resent that. The same group that could not stand the sight of a Negro outside of serving as a bootblack or as a domestic servant in their house. The same group will see the day when we are going to have Negro public officials in Gary, let alone hunkies like us. Yes, my dear friends, the day is not far off. We are going to, and we should have, by all fair means, if he is capable and qualified, a Negro mayor in the city of Gary. Chicharis was as popular in the black parts of the city as he was in the white precincts. He actively supported the NAACP and other civil rights movements of the late 50s and early 60s. Early in his term as mayor, Chicharis welcomed Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to Gary and presented him with a key to the city. That was in 1959. By the early 60s, the civil rights movement was sweeping the nation, and the spirit was being felt in Gary's black community. Uh, once the civil rights movement started, people had uh, more courage, uh, they were more motivated, they were more determined to do something about social ills in our society, which had been ignored for hundreds of years. And I think it was the civil rights movement that provided the stimulus for the people of Gary to say, this is a major problem, and we are going to do something about it. One thing Gary's African-American community wanted to do something about was the discriminatory hiring practices of some local companies. During the 40s, the Urban League did a study on the situation. The report clearly showed the extent of the problem. The basic problems confronting the Negro population of Gary are due primarily to its lack of employment opportunities. Prior to World War II, efforts by Negroes to secure opportunities in the chemistry division of one of the steel mills were flatly denied. The officials in charge claimed Negroes would not be acceptable at parties and other social events which were periodically sponsored by workers in the division. One retail executive when queried on the use of Negro sales girls said, I'm sure it can't be done without disrupting business. Many of our sales girls are southern born and would object to using the same sanitary provisions used by Negroes. Attorney Hilbert Bradley founded the Fair Share Organization, which picketed numerous businesses, trying to get them to change their hiring practices. The Anderson Company, for example, had over 1,200 employees making windshield wiper blades in Gary. Only three were black. The hospitals were also the target of protests by a coalition of over 20 civil rights groups which had formed in the city. They wanted the hospitals to improve their hiring of black physicians and staff. Another target for change was housing. When I moved to Gary in 1960, immediately I realized that housing was quite an issue. Uh, we were looking for an apartment. And of course, we were new in the area and we did not know about uh, the racism that existed and the housing pattern. Like many African-American newcomers to Gary, Katie Hall and her family quickly found out that there were sections of town where blacks did not live and only one section where they were welcomed. And if you were an African-American, you had to rent something in Midtown. And we did not know that. We were looking at apartments on 5th Avenue, 11th Avenue, Westbrook Apartments, Glen Park, the Miller area, the West Side. And we were not aware of the fact that in Gary, blacks were confined to what was called Midtown. In 1960, the census reports say there were over 33,000 people living south of the Little Calumet River in the section known as Glen Park. Only three of them were black. There were 5,000 people living in Miller on the city's far northeast corner. Only six were black. But in Midtown, there were over 64,000 African Americans crowded into a seven square mile section of town. Seven square miles in a city that was about 70 square miles in size. But that's where 93% of Gary's blacks lived. 
And in Midtown, uh, there was such a shortage of decent housing until blacks had to live in basements and attics. And in some homes, we found three and four families living in just one house, just one single family home. But that many families had to live there because they had no place else to go. They could not uh, be allowed to, they, they were not allowed to rent anything uh, outside of the Midtown area. In the early 1960s, Gary's African Americans began a fight for open housing, the right to live in any section of town. Just days after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. led over 200,000 marchers on a march for civil rights in the nation's capital, eight to 9,000 marched on Gary City Hall. Entertainer and civil rights activist Dick Gregory spoke at the rally. One of the main targets of the protesters was segregated housing. When Chicharis resigned, city controller John Vesklosky became mayor. He did not run for re-election. The political organization built by Chicharis and former mayor Peter Mandich was backing city judge A. Martin Katz for mayor. Katz made a major push for the black vote and announced his support for open housing in Gary. He ran no better than third in the white precincts, but won a huge victory in the black precincts. Katz won the election by 3,000 votes over reform candidate Emory Conradi. It was a bitter campaign, with Conradi charging that the election had been stolen by the political machine. He ran again in the fall as an independent, but Katz, who brought in gospel singer Mahalia Jackson for a concert just days before the election, once again won the strong support from the black community. But the vote Katz got in the black precincts was nothing compared to the vote received by a 30-year-old candidate for city council at large. Richard Gordon Hatcher was born in Michigan City and had only lived in Gary about four years when he ran for city council in 1963. But when he moved here, he and about 15 other young black men formed an organization. Along with uh, some other um, uh, young men at the time, decided we would craft an organization that we called Migwathania. Uh, and the agenda of Migwathania was, and that's certain, but um, the term Migwathania comes from Kenya. The word translated into English simply means to be united. It was the name of a newspaper that General Cunetta, uh published, an underground newspaper that he published when they were fighting in Kenya to drive the British out of, out of Kenya. And so we decided that, that was a good name <coughs> for our organization because at that time, first of all, Gary was rigidly segregated in terms of housing. And we thought that um, there was a potential for making our presence felt in Gary in a manner that was different than had been the case with all previous involvements of the African-American community. Our sort of long-term goal was to get involved in the political scene because it was very clear that it was politics in Gary that decided almost everything. Uh, there was no decision almost that could be made that wasn't a political decision. 25 years earlier, a group of young immigrant and first-generation men formed Club SAR in Gary. Their club built trust in the ethnic neighborhood by helping the needy and was a political base for its members. Migwathania was doing the same thing in the black community in the early 60s. From Club SAR came a generation of Gary political leaders, including Mayor Chicharis and Mandich. Migwathania was about to do the same thing. Out of that original 15, um, uh, uh, we wound up with mayors, city council persons. Dozier Allen was, was a member of Migwathania. Uh, in other words, uh, ultimately, out of that relatively small group of people came <clears throat> the future leadership uh, of the city of Gary. Hatcher was the top vote getter in the race for council at large. In his first term he was chosen to serve as president of the city council. The newly elected mayor appointed a committee on human relations. Heading up that committee was Roman Catholic Bishop Andrew Grutka. The committee drew up a civil rights bill that was to be presented at the city council, a bill they called for open housing. The council was split. When the bill came up for first reading, it passed five to four. Councilman Hugh McLaughlin, representing the white neighborhood of Glen Park, cast the deciding vote. He had to have a police escort to leave the meeting. Two months later, when a final vote was to be taken, McLaughlin changed his vote, and the measure went down to defeat. 
But Gary's black community was not giving up. Reverend Julius James organized the Gary Freedom Movement. They staged a pray-in to demonstrate their feelings, blocking the intersection of Fifth and Broadway for 15 minutes in March of 1965. During the previous Christmas season, they organized a boycott of local businesses which opposed the Civil Rights Bill. But their most effective protest was picketing the working place of Councilman Paul Geist, one of the opponents of the bill. He was the manager of the Tolleston branch of Gary National Bank. The Gary Freedom Movement not only picketed the bank, but urged blacks to remove their money from Gary National. Geist resigned from the council, and Mayor Katz used his influence to get John Armenta appointed to fill his seat. With Armenta's vote, the Civil Rights Bill was signed into law by Mayor Katz. It created a Human Relations Commission, whose job was to see that open housing and civil rights became a reality in Gary. In the 50s, the music of a group of Gary Roosevelt graduates was a national hit. Good Night, Well It's Time to Go was recorded by the Spaniels. It was written by band member James Pookie Hudson. Hudson, the one wearing glasses, was a product of Gary's Delaney Housing Project. He says the group got started by singing on city street corners. Good night, sweetheart, well, it's time to go. But in the early 50s, they were discovered by a Gary disc jockey. Her name was Vivian Carter. Her Living with Vivian show, in which she called herself the hostess who loves you the mostest, was broadcast nationwide. It was one of America's top shows featuring black music in the early 50s. When the Spaniels came along, Carter, her husband, and her brother started their own record label. The name of the record company was VJ Records. It was one of the most successful black-owned music labels in the nation, a top competitor of another growing black label, Motown. on the VJ label in America. The Beatles moved on to another label and on to legendary status in the music world. VJ was still putting out the hits from other artists, but by 1965, the company went into bankruptcy and folded. Carter came back to Gary to live. Some say that in 11 years, Vivian Carter went from rags to riches and then back again. Some 25 years after leaving the mayor's office, A. Martin Katz summed up the years he served as mayor in 12 words. We were right in the midst of a revolution yeah. going sweeping the country. Gary was right in the middle of the shifting tide. Katz wanted a second term as mayor, but despite his support for open housing and other reforms, some still saw him as part of the old political machine. At some point, the idea really began to take hold. Not necessarily that I would run, but that really someone should run. And that person could be a black. Might be white, but could be a black. But it was going to, most of all, it was going to be someone who uh, was committed to a reform uh, platform. That is, uh, who were going to get rid of uh, the... Um, uh, uh, the illegal activities uh, that were so rife uh, uh, during that during that period uh, in Gary. Hatcher decided to run. By 1967, Gary was 57% black. But among registered voters, whites outnumbered blacks. So an election, run purely on the race issue, would have meant a victory for cats. With little money running against a strong political organization and running against a candidate who still had support in the black community, the prospects did not look good for Hatcher. And when we initially began to run, and I would tell people or go to people and ask them for their support, prominent, uh, fairly prominent people in the black community, they would laugh. 
They would laugh. They did. They 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 thought that I should lie down until the thought passed. But another candidate entered the race. A white candidate with a familiar name. Just four years earlier, Emory Conradi ran for mayor and finished a strong second. Many in the Conradi campaign felt the election had been stolen from their candidate by Gary's Democratic organization. Conradi died not long afterwards, but his brother, Bernard Conradi, entered the Democratic primary as the third major candidate. With the possibility of the white vote being split, suddenly it looked like Hatcher could win the Democratic nomination. Pressure was put on Conradi to drop out of the race, but he was determined to beat the political machine that defeated his brother four years earlier. They could not move him. They could not persuade him. And they tried all kinds of things. They offered him money. They offered everything. But he absolutely refused. Hatcher won the primary. Katz won almost a third of the black vote, while Hatcher won less than 5% of the white vote. But Conradi ran well in the white precincts and accomplished his goal. He kept Katz from winning. The history of Gary at that point as with the history of Lake County, was that if you could win the Democratic primary, you could basically go home and go to sleep. The Republican nominee was not an experienced politician. He was a furniture store owner, Joseph B. Radigan. In a normal election, Hatcher would have been the heavy favorite, but this was not a normal election. Shortly after winning the nomination, Hatcher met with John Krupa, the chairman of the Lake County Democratic Party, they met in the restaurant of the Hotel Gary. Hatcher says Krupa offered to support him if Hatcher would let the county Democratic Party select the new police chief, city attorney, and city controller. Hatcher said no. I think he was genuinely shocked. I think that uh, he had no idea that I would take that, uh, that position. And <clears throat> so... He said, well, you know, we won't support you if you're not going to do that. I said, well, I would like to have your support. I'd like to have the support of my party. I said, but I am not going to uh, uh, allow anyone else to make decisions that the people elected me to make. I'm going to make those decisions myself. Krupa left the meeting and publicly began to question Hatcher's loyalty to America. He called on Hatcher to prove his loyalty by denouncing a list of well-known people who signed an ad that appeared in the New York Times which voiced opposition to the war in Vietnam, including actors Marlon Brando and Jane Fonda, and civil rights activists H. Rapp Brown and Stokely Carmichael. And I said, no, I'm not going to denounce uh, those people, Marlon Brando, uh, Jane Fonda. I said, I don't know those people. I've never met them. Uh, they've never said anything to me. I've never said anything to them. I'm not going to uh, denounce them. Well, uh, uh, for him and for a lot of other Democratic leaders, that was it. That, that, that proved that what he was saying about me was true. Now, he will not deny, denounce Stokely Carmichael and H. Rabbit Brown. Uh, in 1966, he uh, stated in the Muhammad Speaks publication that he did not understand why the North Vietnamese didn't try the American flyers, captured American flyers, as war criminals. In addition to that, uh, he has surrounded himself with an element uh, in Gary and around the Chicago area who are always involved when there's something... Uh, anti-American or pro-communist, and it just seems this element's always there, and then Dick Hatcher is a fellow traveler. Amid predictions of violence and vote fraud, Gary, Indiana will elect a new mayor Tuesday. The contest matches Negro attorney Richard Hatcher and Joseph Radigan, white furniture store owner. Though neither candidate has deliberately made it that way, race is the overriding issue. The election was drawing national attention. Both Gary and Cleveland, Ohio, were on the verge of electing black mayors. Never before in American history had a major city been led by an African-American. With no help from the local Democratic Party, Hatcher looked nationally for financial support. He ran an ad in the New York Times and other major papers asking for help. Hatcher was invited to New York to appear on television. Senator Robert Kennedy also contacted him and threw a fundraising party for him in New York City. Although the local Democratic Party offered no help, other prominent national Democrats came to Hatcher's aid, including Vice President Hubert Humphrey, locally Indiana Senator Birch Bayh, Congressman Ray Madden, and Mayor A. Martin Katz, all Democrats, endorsed Hatcher. 
but the local party, led by Krupa, was increasingly active on Radigan's behalf. Maybe the biggest help Hatcher received in the final days of the campaign came not from financial contributors, but from a white Polish-American precinct committee woman who lived in Glen Park. Just days before the election, Marion Tokarski said, Krupa and the Democrat precinct organization were planning to steal the election. Each one of us kind of were told that they were cheating out in the midtown and that we would have to cheat to beat them, which that kind of justified, uh, maybe in a way, what I was doing. Why did you want to beat Hatcher? Because um, we were kind of buffaloed into believing that he was associated or a member of the Communist Party. You don't believe that now? No, no, I don't believe it now. And it turned out that the thing that had caused her to decide to tell someone, she had gone to uh, <clears throat> uh, church, uh, and, and she said when the priest, you know, was delivering his sermon, it was like he was, she was the only person in the church, because what he was saying, you know, he knew nothing about any of this, but it was just hitting her. And uh, that's what caused her to feel that she had to tell someone. Uh, what was going on. Besides being county Democratic chairman, Krupa also controlled voter registration in Lake County. Tokarski alleged that over a thousand names were on the voter registration list, names of people who did not exist, but who would still be voting on election day. Based on Tokarski's allegations, Hatcher went to federal court. The night before the election, the court ordered Krupa to remove those names from the list. The court also ordered him to add the names of 5,000 black residents, who the county election board had said were not eligible to vote. And so with National Guardsmen in the background, Gary prepares to go to the polls. Perhaps the big issue is not whether a Negro can be elected mayor of a major American city, but whether a major American city can conduct an election honestly and without fear of violence. John Hogan, WGN News, reporting. Governor Roger Brannigan ordered the National Guard to be on alert. For the second time in Gary's history, the first time in 1909, voters went to the polls with troops ready to move in if violence erupted. It never did. The election went off peacefully, and when the votes were counted, Hatcher won by less than 2,000 votes. You couldn't drive down Broadway because people, the street was just jammed, and people were dancing, uh, dancing in the street. They were so happy, uh, and uh, it was, it was, an amazing feeling uh, that I had. Hatcher's victory was hailed by National Democratic leaders. Some said his election symbolized a new era in America and said it gave new hope to African Americans nationwide. It uh, pointed out men and women are selected on the basis of what they stand for and their principles and not on the basis of religion or of nationalistic origin or color. I think it's a great thing for America and a great thing for our communities. Do you think there might ever be a uh, Negro mayor of Chicago in the future? Well, the answer to that is that if he's a competent uh, man or a competent woman, the people will select him or her on the basis of their competency. It was a great evening. We were very pleased, and uh, we realized that the American dream was within reach of all of us. And uh, as we celebrated, uh, we gave thanks. Uh, our hearts were glad and it renewed our hope in America. Uh, we knew then that the dream could be realized by all of us. Inauguration Day, 1968. The city of Gary was swearing in a new mayor, the first African-American mayor in the city's history. For some, it was a moment of hope. But the bitterness of the election would not quickly go away, as Mayor Hatcher discovered on his first day of work. We could not get into the mayor's office the uh, uh, the doors were locked, and no one had any keys. Uh, the my predecessor and his uh, staff had taken all the keys with them, and so we literally were locked out of the uh, of the mayor's office and had to uh, summon a uh, a keymaker, a locksmith who came and changed the locks. Uh, Once inside the office, the new mayor faced other problems, which were not as easy to solve. Nationally, Gary's image was hurting. For two decades, people read and heard stories about vice, political corruption, 
and racial problems in Gary. But an even bigger problem was facing the new mayor. The world was changing in the late 60s, and this one industry town wasn't ready for what was about to happen. Like other major industrial cities in the Midwest, Gary's economy would suffer a major jolt in the years ahead. Like other cities, it would experience an increase in crime and a massive loss of people to the suburbs. And like other cities, problems of pollution, urban decay, poverty, and declining tax revenues would have a major impact. And then there's the problem of race. Generally, the people of Gary were still looking ahead with optimism as 1968 began. To some, it was still the magic city of steel. But the years ahead would produce times that made it tough for even the most cheerful person to smile. Yeah.